Hello, Yasmina, and everybody who is watching. Um, thank you for the introduction, uh, but here's the thing. There's no way I can fit a proper introduction into embedded systems in a 45-minute presentation. I couldn't do it in a 300-page book, let alone your lunch hour. My goal here is to help you understand how embedded software differs from other kinds of software, maybe give you enough information to ask some questions on your own. I mean, if you're already an embedded systems engineer, this is going to touch on most of the topics you deal with on a weekly or monthly basis. But this presentation isn't really for you. It's for software engineers. It's a guide for them to embedded programming. Maybe it's for technical leads or managers who used to be software engineers. Of course, if you're an embedded engineer, don't go away. You may need this presentation to explain to someone else what it is that you do. So my ideal audience member just got handed an embedded project to develop or manage. Usually this happens because its normal caretaker just isn't available. So it gets lumped into software because it looks like programming. This poor software engineer is scratching her head, trying to wrap her mind around the system. She keeps asking, why did they do this? Were they idiots who didn't understand encapsulation and testability? How did they let the schedule get so far behind? Why won't anyone give me a straight answer? The title of this presentation probably should have been, Why Embedded Systems Software Engineers Aren't as Backwards as You Might Think. But I'm not here to defend my career. I love it. I really love what I do. And I hope once you get your toes stuck in, you'll love it too. Those first few steps can be a doozy. So a little bit about me before we get too far into it. I started out as a software engineer and fell in love with gadgets that monitor and touch the world. I've gotten to make many nifty things. A DNA scanner, inertial measurement units for airplanes and race cars, toys for preschoolers, gunshot location systems for catching criminals, and just assorted other medical and consumer devices. But why am I giving this talk? Well, I wrote a book, curiously enough, about embedded systems. My book isn't about one processor or about an operating system. I try to focus on all the common items I've seen over and over again in different products. It covers all sorts of information, hardware, software design patterns, interview questions, and real-world wisdom about shipping products. The target audience for the book is the target audience for this presentation. The software engineers interested are forced to go deeper into hardware. But it's also, for the book, about hardware engineers interested in writing good software, good quality software. So here in this presentation, I'll focus on you software engineers about to take the first step into embedded systems. The book covers the steps 2 through 10. Let's start with the definition. What is an embedded system? As I go through the presentation, I'll keep adding to the definition, but let's start out with something pretty reasonable. It's a bit tricky uh, because there are different things to different people. To someone who's been working on servers, an application developed for a phone is definitely an embedded system. To someone who's written code for tiny 8-bit microprocessors, and even with an operating system, doesn't seem very embedded. I tend to tell non-technical people that embedded systems are things like microwaves and automobiles that run software but aren't computers. Most people recognize a computer as a general purpose device, but that just pushes the definition onto some other amorphous block. Let's try this one. An embedded system is a computerized system that is purpose-built for its application. That lacks pizzazz, but it covers the highlights. Instead of being general purpose, an embedded system is streamlined to do what it needs to do. That streamlining takes its toll on the engineers who build the refrigerators, satellites, and smartphones. Here's the first thing you need to know about embedded software engineers. They probably started out either as software engineers who got sucked down or as hard hardware engineers who enjoyed fiddling with the software. Their educational background is either computer science, like the books on the left, or electrical engineering, like the books on the right. But embedded software is a combination of the two disciplines. A new embedded software engineer is cruising around with only half the knowledge they need. There's been a fair amount of talk about the imposter syndrome in engineering, where a person feels like they don't belong, and are pretty sure they'll be discovered and ostracized any moment now. 
I think this goes doubly for embedded engineers. Until they can pick up the basics of the other discipline, they're definitely faking it. And there will probably always be some gaps. That's why some of my best friends are hardware engineers. So that, piece, that is piece of advice number one. Even though electrical engineers seem to be from a completely different planet, make friends with one or two. Most of them seem to like food, so I'd say start with lunch. And then when you ask them to explain this mess, you'll have a slightly better shot. Okay, don't be afraid of this next slide. It's, it's not as scary as it looks. This is a schematic. It represents the hardware. It describes each component and how they're connected. To be able to use a board, you'll probably need a schematic. All right, my phone beeped. Um, so you'll need a schematic. Uh, it's for those connections, but also because it gives you detailed information about the processor itself and the peripherals it talks to. Learning to read a schematic is actually one of the easiest things you'll learn. Once you get past the possibly tiny font and all the extraneous components, it's a lot like a block diagram, like a system or software block diagram. In general, the bigger the component on the schematic, and the more important it will be to the software. If you have to puzzle out one on your own, Google the numbers near and in the components, starting with the biggest components. While you don't need to be able to read this schematic, the biggest thing is the processor. An Atmel AT-R4008-66A1. What a nonsensical name. I'm glad they're not responsible for naming my variables in software. But there's a lot of information coded into that name. Atmel's the vendor, they make the chip. The 1891 is a family of chips, a pretty big family actually, but one that only Atmel sells. They all have ARM cores. ARM is a different manufacturer that gets OEM'd into other processors. It's a type of low power processor. The uh, R4008 describes which of the many ARM cores it has and the size of the memory on the chip. After the dash, those letters describe how the chip is packaged and put on the board. They don't generally matter to you, but a schematic also provides a list of parts to buy when the company is building the boards. And I've been saying processor, but you may have heard microcontroller, or microprocessor, or DSP. These all mean slightly different things, but the definitions change given the context. So I'm going to stick to processor or chip, and when I say that, I mean the thing that's going to run your software. Whatever the terminology is for it, you need to know what the processor is, those numbers, that vendor and mix of letters and numbers. You need to know that when you go look for the documentation associated with the processor. And you're going to probably, if you're new to this, want to start by looking at the processor's getting started guide. It'll tell you the basics of the build system, such as where to get the compiler. It will walk you through a basic Hello World-like example, which almost always involves blinking lights. The Getting Started Guide will provide some examples, um, and they may tell you where to get more. On the other hand, don't get lost in the data sheet. Those are usually things that the electrical engineer needs to know. Instead, look for the processor's user manual. That's where the good stuff is. There's a snippet of a processor manual on the top of this slide. It describes how to talk to the processor using registers. Registers are like a software API. They tell the processor what you want to do, but like software APIs, you have to talk to them in the way that they want to be talked to. And this snippet is from the middle of the manual, not from the very beginning. So I've made it a little difficult for you. Don't worry about that, because I'm actually going to torture you for a few minutes. I want you to understand that I'm giving you a very surface view of embedded systems. While I want to give you the confidence to talk to embedded software engineers, I don't want you to get overconfident. So for the next couple of slides, I'm going to dive deep into registers and show you how they aren't like software APIs, unless you've been doing some pretty finicky APIs. However, in a couple of minutes, we'll re-emerge to a higher level, hopefully with a new appreciation for the tweaky details. As you get to know a new processor and look at the manual, expect that it will take about the same level of effort as if you were learning a whole new programming language. As with learning a language, if you've already started with something similar, it'll be easier to learn the new one. And if you have learned several programming languages or, or several processors, you'll find that 
new ones become easier and easier. Although this metaphor gives you an idea of the scale of the information you'll need to assimilate, remember the processor itself is a lot more like a large library with an odd interface. Those registers, they're the way you talk to the processor. Say you want to put a you want to pin on the processor to be an output, and then you want to turn it high so you can turn on an LED that's attached to it. This is a pretty normal Hello World-like example. So you set the pin to be an output, and then you set the pin to be on or high. The registers are memory maps, so you can write to a specific address to modify the registers as is shown on the bottom of this slide. However, don't do that. Despite our fondness for C, that code is just as hideously ugly to an embedded software programmer as it is to any other software engineer. Instead, most processor vendors uh, and compiler vendors will provide a header that hides that memory map. And you can treat the registers as global variables, usually accessed through a structure, maybe two, depending on how it works out. If they don't give you a header, make one for yourself, so your code looks more like one of these. Not the register names are different for each processor in this example, but the effect of the code in each line is the same. All set the second bit in the register. Each of these registers is both read and write, but some processors have write-only registers and read-only registers. They're separate. It's kind of like the const keyword in a language. It's a little hard to explain why it's so important, but it is, and there's a good reason for it. Not one I have time to explain today. Suffice to say, some processors have read-only registers and write-only registers, and some have these, you can do both. You'll know when you look in the user manual. There is something every embedded programmer should know, the volatile keyword. This comes up in interviews all the time. It's sort of the dividing line. This is available in C, C++, and Java. If you were to write that bottom snippet of code without the volatile keyword, the compiler could optimize it out. Let's pretend to be the compiler for a moment, looking through the high-level language and trying to make it into a low-level what's going to happen. So a variable gets set to something. We don't really hear what. It's just a number. A function is called that doesn't modify the variable. And then the variable gets set to something else, another constant number. Ergo, the compiler thinks, the variable only needs to get set once and that first one can be removed. However, like global variables, registers have side effects. The volatile keyword tells the compiler that the value of the variable may change unexpectedly and should never be optimized out. All registers should be marked as volatile, and usually they are in that header file you got from the vendor. And while I'm not going to talk about interrupts at all, uh, global variables shared between interrupts and normal code should also be marked as volatile. Your embedded software that you're starting to look at is probably written in C, maybe a subset of C++, maybe Java, although really most of it's in C, sometimes with pieces of assembly that you hopefully never need to look at. But if you're used to a language with garbage collection or one with a built-in dictionary type, you might be in for a bit of a shock. It will be like going from driving around in a nice car you bought last year to a 1979 VW Beetle with starter engine trouble. It's even more difficult to get thrown into a project and need to learn both a processor and a programming language. I'm not sure what to tell you about that, except you need to recognize the learning curve is going to be steep on both. Together, it's going to be even worse. There are lots of good books about C out there, and there will be example code for your processor from that Getting Started Guide. Use it. And even if you've already used C or C++, you may never have had to deal with bit manipulation. On the top is a snippet from a manual, like we saw a few pages back, but with a different processor, so it's a different manual. Now, if you want to set port B3 to be on, maybe again to turn on an LED, how are you going to do that? First, turn over binary numbers. Next are bitwise operation. These act like the logical and, or, and not. But instead of working on the whole variable, they work on each bit individually. Where the logical version of and has two ampersands, the bitwise only has one. Same deal for or. 
As for not, instead of an exclamation point, bitwise not is a tilde, and it reverses every bit so that ones become zeros and zeros become ones. I think I can hear your eyes glazing over, so I'll cut this short. All of this is just information. You can get it from Wikipedia or a book. It may be new to you, but it isn't magic. I'm happy to work in bit manipulation now, and I know hexadecimal numbers pretty well. But this is born of experience. It used to give me a headache, too. Just remember embedded software, and software shares some pretty big commonalities. But there's some differences, too. So I wanted to get really detailed on one point, so you'd see that things go down pretty far from the surface I'm just scratching in this presentation. I chose this point because it's one you may have to deal with, even if you've just started in embedded systems. But let's head back to the surface, stopping along the way to talk about hardware and bugs, which is to say, hardware can have bugs. When I write pure software, if something goes wrong, I only have myself to blame. The compiler is usually rock solid. The computer I use has an odd video glitch b bug, but for the most part, it's a good laptop. Whether I'm using Microsoft Visual Studio, GCC, or Xcode, I'm pretty confident that any incorrect behavior on the part of my code, on the part of the program, is due to some mistake I made in programming. However, in embedded software, that bug could be my software. It could be in the hardware, which may have an error in the, desi in the design. The board may have an error in manufacturing, like a solder glob or a loose wire in a connector, or even a piece of dust that landed on my board this morning. It could be a power supply that's about to fail, or a processor with a known bug, but I didn't get the latest errata. A compiler that was designed really for assembly and not for the fancy C++ features I'm trying to use. Or it may be my software. Bugs aren't necessarily in the software engineer's domain anymore. This uncertainty at every step is difficult. Some might say it's maddening, and that's what drives embedded software engineers insane. But no, of course not. Well, maybe. Now that I know enough about hardware, I can start with the idea that all bugs are software and build a case for them to be hardware or the tools. However, before I got this far, I felt pretty powerless to find where the bug was. It's too easy to throw the bugs over the engineering wall and blame it on hardware. No one likes to be wrong, especially if they are. Saying there's a bug on the board isn't the best way to start a conversation. On the other hand, most people like to help, so ask for it. Remember that hardware engineer you've been cultivating a relationship with, going out to lunch with? Now is the time to buy lunch and ask for a bit of his time. I've been really lucky. I have had great hardware engineers who will sit with me and listen to the problem and help me debug. Maybe modifying the board to help me look at the problem in a different way. My current one doesn't get too cranky when it's just a software engineer because he knows I won't get too cranky when it's hardware. And when it is hardware, I write tests to help him debug the issue or identify it on new boards. And I buy him lunch regularly. Happily, he returns the favor. Remember, developing an embedded system is definitely a team sport. With so many dependencies and places for errors, sometimes it feels like developing a system is like building a house of cards. Well, sometimes it feels like playing a Jenga game crossed with a house of cards, but we'll get to optimizing code in a little bit. I've still got a lot to cover, but before I go on, are there any questions so far? Uh, remember the preface for them was Q, so Yasmina can put them in my question box. I'll take a little drink of water while you type. Alicia, there is one question that has come in, and it is in the Q&A box for you. Okay. Much of this is very low-level C and et cetera. Do you view things like Arduino and embedded devices programmed in .NET and similar languages not that embedded? Work? That's a good question. Um, it depends on what I've been working on. I do occasionally do server software, and when, that, when I've been in that for six months, it seems like anything that I can't mail like a megabyte is definitely embedded. Um, I love my Arduino board. It's awesome. It's a great way to get into embedded systems. But it is programmed in Java, which sometimes is embedded and sometimes isn't. I've never used a device that was in .NET. But the problems are the same. 
Um, I'm going to get to resource constraints in a little while, and that's the one area that it really doesn't matter what language you use. If you have to be thinking about what's going to happen, and you have to be thinking about the hardware and the debugging, it's embedded. I don't see any others, so I'm going to go on, I believe. Okay, next point. Many embedded systems are poorly written. Oh, wait, was I supposed to refute that? No, no, there are reasons why this is true. Not only is there the issue with only knowing half the discipline, there is a problem with the schedule. The schedule is idealized and not that important if you can't make out the details. Suffice to say in the beginning, uh, there's requirements gathering. Then hardware and software get together and start building things. Travel line through the forest. At the end, everything releases on time. Quit laughing. I know that it never happens like that. However, the idea that hardware needs to be finished before software can be finished is a pretty critical one. If the hardware is delayed and the product has to ship on time, guess what gets squeezed? If there's a quality department, they usually bear the brunt of it. And what they're doing is verifying software. So if quality is short, the system will be buggier. And if they find the bug in the hardware, and it can be fixed in software, it is cheaper and faster to do it in software, even if it requires some horrific contortions. For example, I worked on one project where we were supposed to have an external memory to help updating code in the field. When the external memory got flipped around in manufacturing, they couldn't fix it before the goal ship date. So we did software updates in a different way, a way that was much more dangerous if the system lost power in the middle. We didn't have much time to test the new loading method because we didn't know we needed it until the boards were back and we couldn't make the memory work. It worked out okay, but 10 years later, I still cringe when I think about that code. In the schedule here, it looks like software has a big chunk of time at the beginning to read manuals, create a good design, and write software. Kind of. Of course, that time doesn't really exist because the last project was probably late. And if it did, writing software for an embedded system without hardware is a lot like writing a long program and waiting until the end to try to compile it. Embedded software needs to run on the hardware. The software development and debugging time often gets compressed when things go badly in the hardware design and manufacturing stage. It's just the nature of the business. There isn't much you can do to change it. Except, well, one thing. I spend all that free time in the schedule creating hardware tests that can be used to verify the board functions the way it should and that each peripheral responds as expected. These are called bring-up tests because they're most useful when you first get the board back from manufacturing and need to bring it up. Although I'm kind of skipping ahead, back to thinking about you as a software engineer you may not be part of this whole process. Let's return to the idea that you just got an embedded project assigned to you, possibly against your will. You have the hardware and want to run some software. Well, this is one way to figure out that it is an embedded system. Does it have a cross-compiler? A cross-compiler runs on your desktop or laptop computer, but it creates code that doesn't. Instead, the image runs on your target processor. These compilers are usually provided by the processor vendor or by a third party that works closely with that processor vendor. If you were to debug software running on a computer, you could compile and debug on that computer. The system would have enough resources to run the program and support debugging at the same time. In fact, the hardware, your computer, wouldn't even know you were debugging an application as it's all done in software. It's even done above the operating system level. Embedded systems aren't really like that. In addition to a cross-compiler, you'll need a cross-debugger. The debugger sits on your computer and communicates with the target processor through a special interface, an interface that lets you eavesdrop on the processor as it works. It's usually called JTAG, J-T-A-G, regardless of whether it actually implements that standard. 
So the processor must expend some of its resources to support this debugging interface. It has to allow the debugger to halt the processor as it executes. It has to provide additional information. Supporting debug operations adds cost to the processor, and it can slow it down. Some processors support only a limited subset of features. For example, adding a breakpoint causes the processor to modify memory-loaded code to say, stop here. That's how it usually works, even if you're on a PC. However, if your code is executing from flash or some other read-only memory, instead of modifying the code, the processor has to set an internal register, a hardware breakpoint, and compare it at every instruction cycle to see whether that address is being run, and then it will stop when they match. This can change the timing of the code. It can lead to annoying bugs that only occur when you are or maybe aren't programming, or debugging, when you are or aren't debugging. Uh, and these internal registers take up resources, too, so there's only a limited number of them. Usually there are only two. What can you do with two breakpoints? How can you debug? It's possible. You can do quite a lot, actually. But it can make debugging the software feel like a Tetris game on level 10. So processors support debugging, but not as much debugging as you're accustomed to if you're coming from the pure software world. How will you make your software debuggable in a hostile environment? It can be tricky to balance the needs of the programmer and the constraints of the hardware. There are some other tools to help you debug systems. Some of them are unfamiliar to software engineers. I mean, do you want to know how long a processor is spending in a function? That's easy. You can set up an I.O. line when the function starts and then clear it when it ends, hook up the oscilloscope, and watch the signals. Of course, to do all that, you need to know how to use the scope and access the I.O. line on the hardware. I mean, we've already talked about those registers. That's probably the easiest part. You'll need to open up the system and handle the board. And if you're like I was, you may end up killing a few boards out of ignorance of board safety. One hint, don't put a board on a metal plate and then power it on. So if you're new to this, it's okay to ask for help. A good electrical engineer should be willing to help you find the right I.O. line, possibly solder a wire onto the board to make it easier, and help you set up the scope. I like my independence, so I've gotten my hardware engineers to teach me how to do these things for myself. I've collected a whole toolbox, one that my current hardware engineer regularly mooches from. Tweezers, magnifying glass, wire cutters, pliers, even a small flattering iron. I love my DVM or, or voltmeter. My hardware engineer hates it because it's one of the $12 ones, but it does what I need. However, the tool you really need when working with an embedded system is one you're probably already familiar with. Printf. With a debugger that is somewhat feeble, we definitely resort to printf a lot. An embedded system often has to perform operations quickly, and printf can cause problems by changing the timing of the system. I already mentioned that debugging and timing, they can really have an impact on each other. It's kind of like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can't always run what you want and see what you're running at the same time. And I already mentioned about debugging being like playing Tetris. I say printf, but what I really mean is output through serial port. Serial ports are common in embedded systems because they're so very cheap to add to the hardware. On the other hand, printf itself as a function is a costly one. It requires all kinds of software resources. So embedded software, embedded systems without operating systems usually implement something more bare bones, something like just outputting Hello, Alicia, are you still there? Hello. Oh, folks, looks like we Hello, lost... Hello, Yasmina. <laughs> Hi there. Yes, I think we lost her. I think she got disconnected. Can you call... Is there a way we can call her, or... Hello? Do you have her phone number? Yes, we can dial to her. I don't have it. Sorry. I thought you could see how she called in. I'll tell her to call us back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, folks. Looks like we lost our presenter for a moment here. Terribly sorry about that. We are reaching out to her to see if she can call us back. Please stand by.
before we go back, uh, can you tell me what the last thing I said was? Oh, it was a few minutes ago. I don't know, Alicia. Uh, let's see. What code do you think it is? Two slides back, really? So this testing embedded system, uh, that's not right. Print us debugging. Oh, I'm so sorry. Simple debugging with serial port. Okay, we'll go back to that one. And I'll see how far I can go back and hopefully not have skipped too much and yet not repeat it all either. I'm very sorry. Uh, okay. Tool you really need when de working with embedded systems is printf because debuggers are feeble when you have cross compilers and cross debuggers. But using printf changes the timing of the system. It's like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can't always run what you want and see what you're running at the same time. When I say printf, what I really mean is output through the serial port. Serial ports are common in embedded systems because they're very cheap to add to the hardware. On the other hand, printf is a costly function in software. It requires all sorts of software resources. So embedded systems without operating systems usually implement something more bare bones. It's usually just like a text message with a simple integer output. Now kind of neurotic about making sure before I was pacing around. But now I'm going to go back to the slides and make sure we're, we're going to stay on track here for a little bit. Okay. Some might say we can decrease our reliance on hardware and print FD bugging by doing better software tests. And I agree with that. The time I mentioned earlier with the schedule, when I'm waiting for the hardware, that is the time of hardware bring-up tests. Those tests become manufacturing tests. They run when units are produced, especially if you're producing like a million units. I also like the general software unit tests. I like breaking an application up so the ap algorithm can run on a PC and be tested with canned data. Of course, if the computer is 32 or 64-bit, the embedded processor is possibly 16, but that can introduce its own set of bugs. So where do you do the testing? It could be at any of the layers in this figure. If you want to test on the hardware, you can build a widget to inject signals into the communication method. Here, that's the spy wires. But then you need to debug that widget, which is probably its own board and processor, a whole separate embedded system. And if you do that, you still aren't testing the ADC or that sensor. It isn't that embedded software engineers don't test their code, at least I hope not. But there are many places where testing can happen. The more thorough the testing, the better it is, but the longer it takes. Do you really want to simulate the hardware? How precise should that simulation be? I'm not going to make excuses for people who don't try to make up good tests. But remember what I said about the schedule. Embedded software ends up being crunched for time. Then they try to build a software try to build a system without adequate means for debugging. Then someone comes along and says they should try agile development, write test code for every single line of code. Well, that's the time to take a deep breath. There are really good points to that type of development, that type of process. I read a neat book by James Grenning called Test Driven Development for Embedded C. It describes some ways to thoroughly test embedded code and make it more robust. But overall, you can't just drop in a software development process. It needs to be adapted to embedded software and not used blindly. But really, that was all probably settled before you got settled with this project or team. I keep assuming you'll want to join us in embedded software, but let's go back to the idea that you've been given a system to babysit. Here are some tactical questions that, uh, to ask when you go, things go wrong. You'll be surprised how many bugs can be solved by slowing down. Verifying the system is powered on, not only the whole system, but each peripheral that could be causing trouble. It's a good use for that voltmeter. And because the system uses a cross-compiler, 
and the code needs to be loaded as a separate step, usually a manual step. There are plenty of times when the bug doesn't get fixed because the system isn't running the intended code. They seem like easy, obvious things, but smart people tend to get tripped up in the commonplace details. I'll show this slide again at the end because we haven't covered map files yet. But these are some of the questions you can ask when things go wrong. Maybe it's asking of yourself. Maybe it's asking of your embedded systems team. I'm a big fan of just talking through the problem. Many things can be solved by laying out what you expect versus what is actually happening, sort of a diff of the real world. I've got one more section to cover before we get to general questions, uh, but I see there are already a couple of questions in the Q&A box, so feel free to type them up. Where does GPU shader programming fall in the continuum of embedded programming, if at all? So I don't know how many people have heard of this, uh, probably most of you, but you can use a GPU to do more than just graphical processing. You can do really big scale math on it, and it's very useful. Um, I guess my question back to you is, do you use a cross compiler? Do you build for the GPU, or do you go through some of the tools that exist to allow you to do that? I mean, CUDA, the library that's very useful for that, definitely has some aspects of embedded and some of not. There isn't a single line. There, I can't, at the beginning I wanted to say, what exactly was an embedded system? I, there isn't one answer. Warwick, who of the excellent question before, asks, does your book address the decision to use some sort of embedded operating system? Um, no, actually, because my book, uh, after a lot of discussion, uh, O'Reilly and I decided I was going to go without an operating system. It does talk about when not to use an operating system and the trade-offs with that decision, but there are a lot of commonalities to general embedded systems. Whether you're using embedded Linux or VXWorks or Android, there are things you still need to understand. And you need to understand what the operating system is doing for you and the costs associated with that. I have a lot of questions and now my window is all very confusing. I should have asked Yasmin about this. Nicholas Flavin, uh, is a compiler really reliable or should we use assembly? Oh, uh, assembly is horrible. It is hard to read. It's usually easier to just rewrite it than to even try to read what the other person wrote. Of course, then you end up with a different set of bugs. Most embedded compilers are pretty reliable. In the last five years, the reliability has mm, gotten better like, geometrically. It's, it's, it used to be you could find lots of bugs. Now it's more on the I'm using inherit, multiple inheritance in C++ and it doesn't work right. So I wouldn't use assembly. If you opt to use assembly, I would recommend writing it in C and looking at the list file and then modifying it. I'm going to talk a little bit about hand-tuned assembly. So if, if that didn't answer your question, feel free to ask again. Jerry Brown asks, what is a good low starter low-cost starter platform from someone interested in learning about embedded systems at home. Arduino is excellent. Um, that is a really good place to start. And at like 20 bucks, you can get something pretty nifty. I have an Arduino board and a couple of uh, I squared C LEDs that I can program and, and they end up on our pumpkins and on our Christmas trees and even on my shoes sometimes. Another board is the MSP430. It costs like $4.30. Um, I was at a conference and I said it cost $5 and the TI guy was like, no, it costs $4.30 because it's the MSP430. It's a more difficult language to learn. If you've never seen C, the MSP430 is harder to wrap your mind around. But it's so cheap and if you want to ever do a, a manufacturable thing, it's a great place to look. Many of the dev kits, many of the processor vendors are coming out with good dev kits. The other one that I want to mention is the LPC Expresso. Uh, at about 30 bucks, you get something that is 
pretty high powered, a 32 bit processor with plenty of RAM and not enough code. I mean, you're not going to hit your head right away. Uh, so there are lots of good ones. Uh, there's also a book, I believe, called It's the Making Arduino Book, and it goes through more hobbyist uh, formats. That one's from O'Reilly, too. Okay, I'm going to take a couple more, and then I'm going to go back to the regular presentation. How to evaluate different embedded compilers and operating systems and why? That one I'm going to save to the end. So um, thank you, Ruja. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And another from Nicholas Slavin. Uh, what about hardware models to speed up software development? Hardware models can be very expensive. If you're making 10 million of something, sure, create a simulation. Um, and create one that's good, one that connects the schematic all the way to the compiler and you can run on a virtual hardware machine. But if you're making a thousand of them or starting a startup, it's hard to make those models be realistic. They end up being more work than they're worth, especially when you can get fast turn boards pretty fast. Even better, you can get development kits that have your hardware or have your processor that at least will give you a, a jump start on development. Okay, now we're going to go and talk about resource optimization because some of the questions we've been getting here. Um, I mentioned earlier about not having enough resources when debugging, but it goes much further than that. Uh, not having enough oomph is another characteristic of what makes a system embedded. I gave that bland definition of what is an embedded system at the start. An embedded system is a computer as a system that is purpose-built for its application. Well, because its mission is narrower than a general purpose computer, an embedded system has less support for things that are unrelated to accomplishing its particular job. The hardware often has constraints. For instance, consider a CPU that runs more slowly to save battery power, uh, a system that uses less memory so it can be manufactured more cheaply and processors that only come in certain speeds or support certain subsets of peripherals. This triumvirate shows the big resources, and you may hear about trading these, exchanging one for another. To an extent, an application, to, can, an application can use more RAM or, or even code space uh, to ease problems due to the processor that can't go fast enough. Alternatively, if there isn't enough code space, the processor may have to do more work, maybe to calculate values instead of having constants in the code. This sort of optimization is difficult. It's definitely an advanced topic in embedded systems. However, it's important to understand the cost-benefit analysis of optimizing embedded software. Once a function is identified as slow and written in hand-tuned assembly to make it go faster, no one will ever want to change that function again. Not even the one who wrote the assembly maybe especially not the one who wrote the hand-tuned assembly. And once RAM is optimized so it's shared between two modules, the encapsulation is forever damaged. Changing either of those modules may break both of them. And if you run out of code space, a bug that should be simple to fix may require tweaking of 15 other lines of code just to make room for the fix. We try to leave margins, but sometimes those margins get used. So when you ask an embedded software engineer why they did something and they reply, that is how it's always been done, that may be a complete cop-out. Or it may be an important statement about the fragility of a system that has been optimized to work for the resources available to it. Let's start with the speed of the system. Processing speed comes in different shapes and sizes. It isn't just about clock speed. Processing power also depends on other parts of the hardware, such as how long it takes to access memory, whether there's a hardware method for storing data quickly as it comes from or goes to a peripheral device. The size of the registers matter. A 32-bit processor is usually faster than an 8-bit one, even if they're running at the same clock speed. And speed gets constrained in different ways. I said lower clocks uh, consume less power. So if you're running a battery system, you're going to need to optimize the code to get more done in the fewer cycles allotted. Or you may have a system that skims on processing power because slower processors are generally cheaper. Of course, less memory also makes for a cheaper and more efficient power system. 
not having enough RAM can be a big shock to PC software engineers. But it can be a neat puzzle to implement a complex algorithm, especially when you get the small snippets, small steps using just snippets of data instead of storing a huge chunk and post-processing it. And I've heard so many people squawk, what do you mean you don't use malloc? Well, malloc takes RAM. When you're counting bytes, you need to know where everything goes. The only way to be able to do that is to allocate everything at compile time, which can be ugly. I suppose you need to know where the memory is, such as this memory map from a processor manual. That first megabyte reflects the contents of one of the other two. It isn't real memory, it's just the reflection. Then there's a megabyte for internal flash. That's where the code goes. And a megabyte for internal RAM. These are just resources, though. The actual chip you can buy from this family, the one with the most resources available, only has 256K of flash and only 32K of RAM. It's about enough RAM for about two seconds of compressed MP3 music. And while there are many techniques for optimizing RAM, one of the most common is to have a large chunk and share it between two modules, like I was saying before. Sometimes the two modules uh, need the same data, and copying it is slow, and there isn't enough RAM anyway. More often, each module trashes the other's data, taking turns using the RAM. As long as everyone is polite, it works out fine. But odd bugs happen when both modules write to the buffer at the same time, interleaving the data with disastrous results. I'm going to quietly back away from that gnarly mess, and you should too. Sometimes when you don't have enough RAM, it makes for code that looks like a mess. But let's go into code space. I mentioned the chip had 256K of flash, which is, uh, flash is a common non-volatile memory type, so it remains constant through power cycle. It can be reprogrammed, but not necessarily easily reprogrammed, not like RAM. It's closer to read-only memory. Some projects do still use true read-only memory, but that's usually for consumer products where you make a whole lot of them. 256K of code actually seems like a lot to me. Uh, but then I just spent a year working on a project that's only 32K, which was like packing data and algorithms in. They were like sardines in a too small can. When you need to look for memory, both RAM and code space, the file to look in, the file to start with is the memory map. This is an output from the compiler. Sometimes you have to say it, set the compiler to make it actually do this. And it says where all of the variables and functions actually got put in the code. Map files are ugly. But sometimes they provide the only way to understand how the code's functioning on the hardware. There are other files you may need to dig into, linker files that describe how you want the memory map to be, assembly files that cover how the system starts before it ever gets to main, and list files that describe what your code really looks like to the processor. But I'm out of time, and that's why I wrote a book. So as you think about questions for me, I want to say I really enjoyed preparing this presentation. I'm sorry about that glitch, but I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry if I lied about the gentle part of this introduction to embedded systems. And while I don't generally like to have too many words on a slide, there were no simple icons to describe the big points I want you to take away from this webcast. I suppose it could be summed up with, I hope you feel a little more comfortable about embedded systems and embedded software engineers. I hope you understand some of the challenges that are different from what normal software has to tackle. Finally, for all that I've told you how hard it can be, it can be really fun. I don't want to discourage you, especially you with the hobbies. Make it a gadget that does something, even as simple as blinking lights or seeing something you've helped build on target shelves. It's an amazing feeling. And the work itself is interesting. The puzzle aspect of coding, that's always been my favorite part. In embedded systems, there's another dimension or two to the puzzle. It makes it more fun. Okay, questions. I have one from last time. Do please uh, please preface them with a cue. So how to evaluate different embedded compilers and operating systems? Which one is better and why? I deferred that because there is no answer. Um, evaluating different embedded compilers, years ago I did a project where we tried to figure out which ones conformed to C99, the, the standard for C at the time. And most of them failed. They just had tweaky little like uh, precedence issues. Now, most of them would pass. But would most of them pass the same sort of rigorous analysis for C++? No. And 
I use GCC a lot. It's, you know, cheap. Even the ARM GCC, it's pretty good. But there are ones to pay for, and there are good reasons to do it, especially if you need very optimized code, either because you don't have enough code space or because you don't have enough processing cycle. As for operating systems, uh, again, Linux is a favorite. There are embedded Linuxes that are pretty good, but it depends on what you need. I've done most of my career without operating systems. I do bare boards programming, and I really enjoy it, but it's not for everyone. I, I like interrupts. I like how all of this fits together, but the bigger the system, the more you're going to need an operating system. So I can't. I can't answer your question. If you want to give me some more details, I might be able to. Uh, Yasna, I can't access this anymore. Are we out of time and therefore it's closed, or do I just need to... No, let's just do a quick refresh. There may not be any additional questions. All the questions that came in were in that Q&A tab. So if you're not seeing any new ones, then we have answered all of them. <laughs> Could you push it to the next slide, please? Sure. Uh, so I want to say thank you to O'Reilly, uh, my hosts here, all of our hosts, and all of you who have listened, and especially those of you who have asked questions. Also, I do want to do a little thank you to Yaron Kidron, a software manager who was my guinea pig in developing a presentation that could address some of the things that annoy non-embedded engineers the most. I'm Alicia White. Logical Elegance is my consulting company specializing in embedded systems. You can contact me via the web, uh, company's website or on Twitter. And if you are in Silicon Valley, uh, there's a book release party at Digital Guru in Sunnyvale this Friday from 5 to 8 p.m. We'll be handing out toys and goodies and books, and, and it's at a really cool bookstore. 